Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 82 of the Dear Herbalist podcast titled The Secrets Behind Herbal Remedies, Top 10 Actions You Should Know, Part 2. Tonight, we're going to talk about a few more herbal actions. I'll give you another 10. And then I'm going to give you some key formulation considerations when working with herbal actions. So if you are new to this channel, you are most certainly welcome. Please consider subscribing to all of my social media at the Demystified Herbalist. And if you are a continued listener, and if you have not subscribed, please consider subscribing to all of my social media channels. I would certainly appreciate you guys' support. Thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to listen to my podcast. I certainly appreciate that. And also thank you for your comments as well. Your appreciation helps me appreciate you even further. No, but, you know, your appreciation is really important. This is a work. I do put a lot into it. I do study and research and all that to make sure that I'm bringing you accurate information, but also information that you can use right away. I'm not an herbalist that's going to talk at you, but I want to teach you. I want to help you to know and understand and hopefully overcome some common pitfalls and things that, you know, I had to deal with being a new herbalist. And um, the waters were kind of muddied and there were a lot of gatekeepers and all of that. So I'm trying to eliminate all of that and do my part, my little part here um, in the earth to get you the information that you need immediately. And you can turn around and go use it to help your family and help the communities that are around you. If you are paying attention to what's going on in the world today, you understand that the healthcare system is failing. People are understanding that there is a lot of issues going on. There's a lot of uh, medications being thrown around unnecessarily. There's a lot of errors being done on the behalf of people that should know what they're doing, right? So this is even the more reason why as herbalists, whether you're a clinical herbalist, whether you're someone that studies herbals, whether you teach people about herbal medicine, whether you create products, there's a space for us here. There's always been a space for us here and there's definitely a need. People are going to start looking around and they already are for other methods to help address their issues. They're tired of the medicines. They're tired of the, let's try this. Well, we'll increase this. If that don't work, then we'll, we'll throw that in there. And if that don't work, we'll put 10 more on there. And while you're giving me 15 different pills to shove down my throat, have you checked my renal function? Can my kidneys handle all this? Is the liver all right? Okay. Doctors are, I mean, it's a, it's a revolving door. In some of these organizations, doctors are, are leaving, going to different places. So what happens is now the next doctor has to go through your file. And if your medical history is long, that's another process, right? And if they have 500 patients, I mean, come on, they're only one person, right? So what that means is because there are gaps, because there are errors, There is a need for you as an herbalist. There is a need, even if you, let's say you don't want to dive deep into herbal medicine. If you're the one in your community, in your neighborhood, on your block, that knows something about herbs and what they can do, if you even help somebody next door to you, you are effective. So it's not about knowing all and everything, but it is about making sure that you know what you need to know for what you're here for. And if you're here to help understand plants, to help someone else, then do that. And understand the plants you need to know in your area. That way you can get them for free. (laughs) Get them and find them for free, right? All right. Tonight, we are going to talk about 10 more herbal actions. And then I'm going to give you some key formulation considerations when working with these herbal actions. So let's dive into the quick 10. Go ahead and get your notepad, your pens, your papers, your receipts, whatever. All right. Number one, amenagogues. E-M-M. E-N-A-G-O-G-U-E. These herbs stimulates and or increases your menstrual flow. They promote menstruation. They regulate your menstrual cycles. All right. Now, the issues that these particular herb actions address are irregular periods as well as menstrual cramps. Now, the best forms to administer these are teas and tinctures. The next one is the diaphoretics. D-I-A-P-H-O-R-E-T-I-C. Diaphoretics increase sweating, okay? They increase perspiration and they help reduce fever. 
Now, why would you use something like this? You would use this if you want to eliminate toxins from the skin. You want to eliminate flus, colds, that type of thing, because the body, it, it tries to sweat itself right? It tries to help reduce your fever by sweating. It helps cool the body down. This is the reason why you would want to use something like this. And the best forms to use it is hot teas and tinctures. Now, my grandfather, long, 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 long time ago, I remember he gave us a, what they call a hot toddy, which does have a little alcohol in it. And he bundled us up really tight and we would just sweat, sweat, sweat. So, you know, he didn't use the word diaphoretic, but I believe at that time, you know, they had that understanding that this is what it does. So get yourself a nice hot tea. He put he put all kind of stuff in there. And we did. We sweat. We look like some little roly polies and just, you know, sweat seeping down. But our fever did go down and we did not have a cold after that. So shout out to my grandfather, R.I.P. All right. Astringents. A-S-T-R-I-N-G-E-N-T. They constrict or tighten your tissues. They reduce secretions and they help tone your tissues. So common issues that astringents address are diarrhea, excessive bleeding, and skin irritations. And the best way to use astringents are through teas, tinctures, or topical application. Next are vulnaries, right? B-U-L-N-E-R-A-R-Y. These herb actions help promote wound healing. They support tissue repair, reduce inflammation. They help with cuts, skin ulcers, internal injuries, right? And the best forms to use these in are salves, poultices, and tinctures. So if you are a product-making herbalist and you are trying to create a salve or something to help promote wound healing, you want to include vulnerary herbs. You want this action from these herbs. All right, check out my website. I do have a wound healing salve on the demystified herbalist.square.site. <laughs> All right. The next herb action is cholagog. Now, these stimulate bile production and flow. They improve digestion. They support liver function, right? So what type of issues do they address? They address gallbladder issues, poor fat digestion, and liver congestion. So any, any type of, let's say, um, congestion, then you want an herb that will stimulate, okay? So these herbs stimulate, meaning that they help move the stagnancy of the bile or the junk or any type of congestion, okay? So the best forms to put the cholagogs in, and that's C-H-O-L-A-G-O-G-U-E. The best forms are tinctures, capsules, and teas. The next herb is alternatives. Now, these herbs gradually restore proper function to the body. They help support elimination of metabolic waste, and they help in detoxification. So you, they are used to address skin conditions, liver congestion, as well as lymphatic stagnation. That means your body's garbage can, which is the lymphatic system, it often can get backed up and stagnated. If that is the case, you want something to help, again, move the stagnation. Now, the best form that you can use alternative herbs in are tinctures, teas, and capsules. But again, you know, I always say from the last one, herb rolled pills, okay? The next one are the galactagogues. And it's weird when I say that. That sounds like some weird Star Wars, you know, little alien beings <laughs> with big heads and little bitty eyes or something. But anyway, that's not the case. G-A-L-A-C-T-A-G-O-G. UE. These promote or increase milk production in nursing mothers. They stimulate lactation, they support breast tissue health, and they address issues such as your low milk supply or even breastfeeding difficulties. Now you can administer these in teas, tinctures, or capsules, herb rolled pills. <laughs> okay. Next ones are the anti catarrhs these A-N-T-I-C-A-T-A-R-R-H-A-L. Now these herbs, these herbal actions, I should say, they reduce excess mucus production. They decrease inflammation in your mucous membrane. They aid in mucus expulsion, helping to get it out of the body. The issues that they address are sinus congestion, bronchitis, and even allergies. So the best forms to 
administer these type of herb actions are teas, steam inhalations, and tinctures. Next herb actions are cardiotonics, C-A-R-D-I-O-T-O-N-I-C. And please, please don't get offended if I'm spelling it. I'm just spelling it because I don't know how I sound to you. Um, sometimes my voice can be raspy. Sometimes I'm drinking water in between and I don't want words to be kind of all over the place, especially if you plan on going back and researching. So I want to make sure I'm very clear. Um, but if you know how to spell it, please don't take offense because I'm spelling it at you. I don't think you're slow. I just want to make sure that you understand which word I'm speaking about. That way, when you research it, you already know and you have the correct spelling. <laughs> but cardiotonics strengthen and tones the heart. They help improve heart function. They support your cardio cardiovascular health and they address issues such as a weak heart, poor circulation, and mild hypertension. Now, the best forms are in teas, tinctures, and capsules, herb rolled pills. <laughs> I'm gonna keep saying that because you know how I feel about that, okay? And then lastly, circulatory stimulants. Now these type of herbs, and that's circulatory stimulants, okay? These type of herbs increase blood flow and circulation in the body. They improve overall circulation, they warm the body, they increase blood flow to your tissues, and they can affect your heart rate and strength. Now, the issues that circulatory stimulants address are poor circulation, cold extremities, okay, cold hands and feet, some cardiovascular issues, okay? So these are the things that they can help address. And also Raynaud syndrome, if you have something like that or somebody that deals with that. Now, the best forms that you can administer these type of herb actions are teas, tinctures, capsules, herbal pills, and sometimes, depending on the situation, topical applications. So some examples of some circulatory stimulants could be ginger, cayenne pepper, and hawthorn. And I'm trying to keep the examples kind of simple because you want to be able to access it, right? And you should know that everything around you, the medicine around you should not be goo gobs amount of money because it's already there okay so in your medicine cabinet herbal medicine cabinet make sure you have cayenne pepper and ginger it's just important it can address a variety of different things okay but remember with all circulatory stimulants use them with caution especially with people that have heart conditions or those on blood thinning medications so you kind of have to treat these particular people not like babies but just be very cautious okay now those are the next 10. And again, like I told you before, there are many. So if you have an herbal notebook, please make sure that you're writing them all down because it is another piece of the herbal formulation puzzle that you'll need to understand when you're looking at how can I address this issue? What herbs do I need to focus on? Okay, so let me give you some key formulation considerations when working with herbal actions. Okay, number one, primary focus and desired outcome you have to identify what is the main goal of your formula, okay? Is it to address headaches? Is it to get rid of the spasms in the back? Is it to help, you know, unclog your pipes, right? <laughs> Does it need to kind of help stimulate bile production and, and get that stuff out of your gallbladder, right? What is your main goal of your formula? Number two, you have to look at if it's for you, your constitution or your temperament, okay? Your un which is pretty much your unique characteristics, okay? Or do you tend to be more of a, a hot person or you tend to be more cold person? Do you tend to be more of an angry individual or more calm and relaxed? These type of things you have to take in consideration when you're looking at working with herbal actions. The other thing is you want to take into consideration, this is number three, energetics of herbs. So taking into account, are the herbs hot or cold? Are they dry or moist? right? And all other energetic qualities. And if you don't know what those are, write them down, look them up and write them down. I don't want to get into them in depth here because I want to stay focused on the key considerations when working with herbal actions. But we will get into it. Um, but if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to me, the demystified herbalist at gmail.com or on any of my social media sites, feel free to send me a message. Now, <clears throat> number four, Synergy between herbs. So you want to look for herbs that work well together and enhance each other's effects. Number five, 
you want to balance the actions. So ensure your formula has a well-rounded set of actions to address the primary concern as well as support overall health. Number six, and this is a key one, tissue affinity. So you want to choose herbs that target specific tissues or organs relevant to the condition. All right. So if you have, let's say, a UTI issue, urinary tract infection, you want to pick herbs, okay, that have an affinity for that particular organ, which is what? Your bladder, right? And your kidneys. So make sure, because there are herbs that have affinities for your bladder or for your kidneys. So you want to know that, okay? That's one of the key pieces as well. Number seven, any type of secondary support. So consider herbs that support related body systems or address any secondary concerns. Okay. And these typically are, you know, symptoms, you know, coughs, these other type of things, or let's say a little bit too much heat in the body, any type of secondary support, you want to consider that. Number eight, potential interactions. So you want to be aware of how herbs might interact with each other or with specific medications. So be aware of that. Number nine, safety and contraindication. So make sure that the herbs are safe for the individual and their specific health conditions. If you have someone that is pregnant, make sure that you are not giving them a herb that will cause them to abort their baby. Okay, it, I'm trying to use something that extreme so that you can kind of get in your head like, okay, I need to be careful. You know, if somebody has a heart condition, you don't want to give them something to speed up their heart. Let's say if that's the issue. So you want to make sure that you ensure that these herbs are safe. And this is the reason why you need to know their actions. Number 10, taste and compliance. So consider the palatability of the formula so that you can make sure your client will actually take it. <laughs> if you're using too bitter of herbs, right, without pairing it with something to kind of balance out the taste, because don't get me wrong, bitter herbs are important. They are very important for the body, especially for someone that is just wrought with mucus. Okay, bitter herbs are very important to the body. But let's say if you give someone an herbal syrup, okay, and you say take 10, 10 tablespoons of this every day or three times a day. Well, if it's ridiculously bitter, unfortunately, they are not going to comply. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying it has to be sugary, syrupy, sweet either. Like you, there's a balance in that because there's some stuff, it just has to give you that. <laughs> but you'll feel better in the morning. <laughs> okay, so it's a delicate balance. Number 11, preparation method. Make sure you're choosing the most appropriate form to administer your herbal formulation. A tea, a tincture, a capsule, or a herbal pill, a suppository, a medicinal wine, whatever it is. Make sure that you are choosing the most appropriate form to administer your herbal preparation for the client's needs, right? Number 12, dosage. Make sure that you determine the appropriate dose behind the herb's potency and the actions needed and the client's needs. Dosage is very important. Making sure that you have a potent herb is important. And if it is super strong, you probably don't need to recommend that much. Remember, if it's super potent, super strong, you don't want to recommend high dosage of something. You don't want to overdo it, right? Number 13, duration of use. Consider how long the formula should be used and any potential long-term effects. And all of these things you want to do your pre-work while you're formulating. You want to do all this pre-work to make sure that you have this understanding. And if you have a client with you, then it's just a part of the work that you would do for them anyway, the, the background research before you create an herbal protocol for them you'll be able to have this background research already done. And don't feel the need to rush through these processes. It's very important. And explain it to your clients. If you want me to help you, this is, this is how this has to go. Because sometimes they just want you to rush because all they're used to is the 15, 20 minute medical uh, conversation that they have over on that side. And here's a prescription and buy out the door. But we don't look at it that way. OK, so so sometimes your clients may still be in that mindset and you have to be a little patient with them, but help them to understand that if you're on this side, this is how this process works. And that's because I want to be careful and make sure that I give you the best recommendation that I can so that it can work for you. OK, so 13 duration of use. OK, consider how long this formula should be used 
and any potential long-term effects. That's very important. Number 14, bioavailability. So select herbs or preparations that will be well absorbed and utilized by the body. That is very important. Will the body be able to take that herb, understand what it is, know where to put it, and work with it so that you can have the desired outcome? It has to be bioavailable. If it's some kind of fake leaf or, or whatever, the body may identify it as, as toxic or foreign, and it's going to get rid of it. So we don't want that. Number 15, quality and sourcing of herbs. So make sure that your herbs are of high quality and sustainably sourced. So when we're talking about high quality, the best way, honestly, that you can ensure that is learning how to forage, learning how to identify plants and going out there and getting them yourself, getting them in the proper season, taking the proper part of the plant. This is the best way that you can ensure that just to be honest, so that you can have a peace of mind. Sustainably sourced is making sure that you're just not going out there ravaging through the plant. You're just snatching up whole plants and well, if you're strong enough, trees and all that. No, that's not, you know. You want to be considerate of the environment as well. All right. Number 16, potential for herb and drug interactions. Be aware of any medications that the client is taking and potential interactions. Stress the importance of, ma'am, sir, I have to know what you are taking. No judgment, but I have to know. Because if I am trying to recommend something for you and it interacts with it, it could have a negative effect. If you are coming to me with arthritis and you're taking a side pill or this or that, and I'm over here recommending the other thing, I don't want them to negatively interact with each other. It doesn't mean that I wholeheartedly agree with your prescription, but we cannot do harm to these clients. They're going to take it anyway. Even if you say, oh, I would recommend if it were me, never tell someone to stop their medication. First of all, never do that. All right. Never, ever, ever do that. But I would say if it was me, I would work to reduce this, okay, so that I can have a better quality of life because of the side effects and because of everything else that comes with it, okay? You can make recommendations, but don't feel backed into a corner to tell someone, yeah, just stop your medicine and just keep it moving. Don't do that because you're going to get yourself in some trouble, okay? And we're not trying to do all that. Just make your recommendation and hopefully they can catch or like they say, hopefully they can pick up what you're putting down. And if they can't, it, just let it be what it is, but keep yourself safe as an herbalist at all costs. Number 17, client's lifestyle and preferences. Consider factors like their daily routine and their willingness to prepare certain types of herbal preparations. Okay. So if you have somebody that is dealing with, let's say insomnia, right? And they're like, I'm having trouble getting to sleep at night and da, 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 da. So you ask them, what was your routine? You know, I tend to ask people that, especially if they have trouble sleeping, what's your night routine? Well, I tend to click on the news. And then while I'm doing that, I'm scrolling on my phone. And then I'm doing a crossword puzzle. And for some reason, I just can't get off to sleep. Well, let's see. <laughs> so I walk them through what their body is doing, right? And your body is constantly scanning and processing information, what's going on in the environment at all times, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is the reason why it's important for sleep because your body it can focus its energies towards healing any damaged tissues, fixing anything in the body, moving out stuff, cleaning, detoxing and all that because your sleep it's not stimulated by the information that you're putting in front of your eyes. If you're sitting down watching the news and the news is death, violence, and destruction, okay, fear-mongering, okay, that increases anxiety. That, it, that heightens a sense of worry and stress. You're not sleeping. Then if while you're doing that, you're on your phone, you're scrolling, you're getting those that all of that, that information into your head. So your body is trying to process what you see, what you're hearing. Okay. Now you're up, you're also doing a crossword puzzle. So now it has to have motor function Our hands are moving now. So it's focusing on making sure that you can move your hands to go through the puzzles. It's using brain energy because it's processing the information, processing what you're hearing, looking at what you're reading and taking all that information in. Nothing about that says I am ready to go to sleep. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> So what that means is that you have to explain to your client, you're not telling your body you're ready to sleep. So everything that you need to do before you go to bed, you need to have a nighttime routine that shuts everything off, the noise, everything. 
get you a candle, get you yourself in the tub, do a body scrub, pray, get all of the junk journal before you go to bed, get all that stuff of the day off of your mind, cast your cares on the most high, get all of that stuff off of you before you lay down in that bed. And it's going to take a little time. Okay. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to take a little time for your body to like, Oh, okay. She's really going to sleep or not even your body. Cause the body is an amazing, adaptable and adjustable creation. It's going to take time for you to, okay. I got in the tub. I did what I needed to do. I did a scrub. I prayed. I wrote in my journal, got everything off of my mind. Now I'm going to lay in the bed and I'm going to fight not to think about what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to fight to think about what that person said to me today or how that person cut me off in traffic or how there's 15 million trains coming through here and I can't get through. I'm not telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I heard. <laughs> okay. So consider the client's lifestyle and preferences. Do they smoke? Do they drink? Are they stressed out? Do they take crack? I mean, you want to know all of these things. You have to consider that because that affects the body. It's all chemistry, darling. All right. Number 18, acute versus chronic conditions. So you want to adjust your formula strategy based on whether the condition is short term, which is acute or long term, which is chronic. 19, layering of action. So you want to structure your formula to address immediate symptoms while also supporting long term healing. It's like a delicate balance. Number 20, adaptability. So create a formula that can be easily adjusted based on your client's response and changing needs. So these are the key formulation considerations when working with herbal actions. And if I was going too fast, forgive me, I try to keep my, my podcast again to digestible bits. Yeah, hit it back on the replay and uh, take some additional notes. But I hope this two-part series, as I'm going to call it, has helped you understanding herbal actions. They are very, very important. They are a part of a puzzle, okay? They're one piece of that puzzle to help you get closer to creating effective formulations and effective remedies. So keep these in mind, all right? Have a blessed evening. Take notes. Get that night routine going if you don't have one. I know it's probably late where you are, but it's okay. If you are listening from across the water, I see you. Thank you so much as well. I appreciate all of you, all of my listeners, no matter where you are, Midwest, South, North, you know, wherever you're from. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, family, I'm out.